We are just beginning to understand the brain of the psychopath. His mind is another matter. Recent neuroimaging research has begun to functionally map the abnormalities of the psychopath's brain, and such findings help us to biologically ground the clinical and forensic extremes of his behavior. But a theory of the psychopath's mind is also important. It guides empirical research. It puts flesh on the bone of empirical findings. It specifies the motivation and meaning of the psychopath's behavior. And most importantly, it helps us understand his discrete experience of the world and thus shapes our realistic perception of the risks that he poses to himself and others. Freud understood the psychopath, but devoted little time and thought to investigating his mind. He wrote in 1928, quote, two traits are essential in a criminal, boundless egoism and a strong destructive urge. Common to both of these, and a necessary condition for their expression, is absence of love, lack of an emotional appreciation of human objects, unquote. We define the psychopath's personality nearly 80 years later in essentially the, two same, the same twofold manner, his pathological narcissism and his cruel aggression. There is also a general recognition that both of these characteristics are fueled by an absence of emotional attachment to others, the bond that keeps most people from physically violating those whom they love. These central traits of the psychopath are also empirically measured in contemporary science through the use of Robert Hare's Psychopathy Checklist Revised, which has identified two factors in the construct of psychopathy, interpersonal affective deficiencies and social deviancy. The current of psychoanalysis runs deep in our current psycho, uh, scientific understanding of the psychopath, and since we are all products of our history, it begins with its early development. Attachment, arousal, and anxiety. The house of psychopath is constructed on a foundation of no attachment, under arousal, and minimal anxiety. These appear to be necessary, related, but insufficient characteristics that provide certain biological predispositions for the development of the psychopathic character. First, attachment. Attachment is a biologically based, species-specific behavioral system which serves the survival of the infant by maintaining the closeness to the caretaker. First conceptualized and investigated by the British psychoanalyst John Bowlby and his colleagues, it is deeply rooted in mammals, but absent in reptiles. The human infant first expresses his object seeking through sucking and crying, behaviors which maintain his physiological balance by obtaining warmth, touch, and food, usually from the mother. During the first few months of life, this proximity seeking becomes more object specific and emotionally refined as the infant attaches most readily to his mother and cries when she deserts him while in a state of need, even if it is momentary. It is during this time when the rudiments of object permanence are first observed. The infant can anticipate the presence of an object that was just perceived and squeals with delight when peekaboo is played or when shown a photograph of mother in her absence will react emotionally to an external image that is also found in the child's mind. As psychoanalysts, we infer that this object representation can be held in the child's mind as a memory for the first time and as one manifestation of attachment. <coughs> attachment is often defined as a strong affectional bond in both children and adults. It was extensively researched during the last half century because it can be relatively easily measured in two ways, proximity seeking to an object and distress when the object leaves, and certain characteristic behaviors when the object returns. It is, it is a stable characteristic in both children and adults, and most human beings with the requisite biology and loving, dependable parents will grow up to be able to form secure attachments throughout their lifespan. Pathologies of attachment, however, have been identified and measured, 
They're typically labeled fearful, preoccupied, disorganized, and dismissive. Most salient to the psychopath's mind is the latter pathology, dismissive, characterized by behavior that indicates a chronic emotional detachment from others. John Bowlby regarded the elements of detachment to be apathy, self-absorption, preoccupation with non-human objects, and no displays of emotion. He initially described it as, quote, affectionless psychopathy, unquote, in his 1944 paper in the International Journal of Psychoanalysis concerning a sample of juvenile thieves. He believed it was caused by constant maternal rejection. Loretta Bender, referring to a child inpatient sample at Bellevue Hospital in another early paper in 1947, regarded emotional deprivation during infancy as a causal factor of, quote, psychopathic behavior disorder in children, unquote. Uh, Kim Bartholomew found that dismissive individuals have a positive perception of self and a negative perception of others and have managed rejection, rejecting parents by distancing and becoming self-reliant, inoculating themselves against the devaluation they have learned to expect. Peter Fonagy argued that weak bonding and the dismissal of objects is a risk factor for violent criminality because there is an absence of an ability to mentalize, to conceive of the other as having a separate, unique mind. The second corner of the foundation for the house of psychopath is the psychopath's autonomic under arousal, particularly to punishment. Uh, Robert Hare conducted the early work on this phenomenon, which demonstrated peripheral autonomic hyporeactivity to aversive events. The direct measure utilized in these experiments was skin conductance or galvanic skin response. His work has been replicated by other researchers throughout the world and has stimulated a most intriguing body of work which has found that habitually violent criminals are, quote, chronically cortically under aroused, unquote. The combined measures of cortical under arousal include three variables, slow wave theta EEG activity, low resting heart rate, and poor skin conductance. These appear to have a predictive power for habitually violent criminality that can override the influence of the environment, especially when the latter is considered normal or good enough, in the words of David Winnicott. Donald Winnicott. Subsequent research also suggests a link between corpus callosum abnormalities and associated behavioral symptoms, such as lack of remorse and social closeness, and neurological responses, including reduced heart rate and skin conductance. Low levels of cortical arousal, and these have nothing to do with IQ or intelligence, have also been implicated in research with children and adolescents who display what's called callous, unemotional traits. They represent about one-third of children diagnosed with childhood onset conduct disorder. And this is work done by the leader in this field, uh, Professor Paul Frick. Such children evidence thrill-seeking and fearlessness, show deficits in responding to negative stimuli, habituate more easily to distress in others, and show lower autonomic reactivity to negative emotional stimuli. This unique temperamental style may predispose to psychopathy in adulthood, but this has yet to be demonstrated. However, heritability of these callous, unemotional traits appears to be substantial. And that's work done by uh, Terry Moffitt and her group. Extending their work on the relationship between chronic cortical under arousal and aggression, Adrian Rain and his colleagues, uh, including, uh, including Salvador Mednick, uh, have published a series of longitudinal studies of a large cohort of children born on the island of Mauritius. This is an island in the Indian Ocean off the coast of, east coast of Africa. This location was selected many years ago to test the hypotheses in a setting removed from westernized culture and to minimize the effects of a criminogenic environment. Their longitudinal study, now in its fourth de decade, continues to support the power of biological variables to predict aggression 
despite other potentially mediating social and environmental factors. Now, the third corner for the foundation for the House of Psychopath is minimal anxiety. Anxiety is an unpleasant feeling that usually signals danger from within or without. When it defends against other affects from a structural perspective, we refer to it as signal anxiety. When it is specifically object-related, we refer to it as fear. When the feared object is patently unreasonable, we may see the patient as phobic or even delusional. Anxiety emerges during development in the service of safety and survival. When an infant sees a stranger's face for the first time, she is likely to view it with rapt attention and curiosity, especially while held in the arms of her parent. If the child is handed too quickly to the stranger, however, the infant will immediately become distressed, often triggering a reaction in the parent to recapture the infant in his arms. The distress immediately ceases because the potential danger has subsided. John Bowlby argued that the evolutionary basis of the causes of anxiety, that is, the appearance of a stranger, actual separation, and the anticipation of loss, keeps the mother in close proximity to the child and the child safe from predators. Anxiety is minimal or absent in psychopathy. David Licken at the University of Minnesota first discovered this when he differentiated between secondary anxious and primary non-anxious psychopaths in his laboratory. Uh, this was a paper published in 1957. Uh, Brian Blackburn in Britain has followed suit with his demarcation between the anxious, moody, withdrawn psychopath and the hostile, extroverted, and low anxiety psychopath. Other laboratory and clinical studies support this finding. Most notably, in conduct disordered children, there is a strong negative relationship between callous, unemotional traits and anxiety. During a recent assessment, a psychopath spent two hours completing the MMPI-2, a self-report measure of personality and psychopathology. He frequently read the items aloud, providing commentary on whether or not they bore any resemblance to his life. His response to an item regarding physical altercations, and this is item number 548, I've been so angry at times that I've hurt someone in a physical fight, is illustrative of the under-arousal and minimal anxiety level often observed in psychopaths. And this is the patient speaking. When I've had to defend myself, I've become more calm and relaxed in a fight. My strategy is to antagonize them. I don't have anger. I get them angry. I take emotions away from myself to handle things cooler. It's not me being angry. I smile and laugh during the whole damn fight. Chronic emotional detachment, cortical underarousal, and minimal anxiety biologically anchor the foundation of the house of psychopath. These substrates manifest in adult psychopathy as a fearless and sensation-seeking lifestyle, one that is unfettered by worry or concern about the rights and feelings of others. Now we go on to failures of internalization. Although the conventional belief is that a neglectful and abusive environment is central to the development of the psychopath, research has begun to call this into question. Marshall and Cook, in a 1999 research paper, found a negative curvilinear relationship between such family experiences and psychopathy. In other words, if we measure psychopathy on a unidimensional scale, such as the psychopathy checklist revised, as adult psychopathy increases into the mild to moderate range, we do see a historical increase in, a, in neglect and abuse while the subject was growing up. However, as psychopathy increases into the severe range, we see a decrease in neglect and abuse while growing up. In related research, Adrian Rain and his colleagues uh, found that functional deficits measured by radioactively tagged glucose activation, uh, this was using the neuroimaging technology of PET, positron emission tomography, in the brains of samples of murders with extensive criminal histories were more pronounced among those from good rather than poor home environments. The suggestive findings of these and other studies is that the more severe the psychopathy, the more psychobiologically rooted is the cause. 
Uh, some still wonder how Louise Bundy and her husband could produce such a child as Ted Bundy, who grew up to be one of the most notorious serial murders in criminal history. Yet most do not know that the man who raised him was actually his stepfather, and his mother had been impregnated by a wayfaring stranger who briefly passed through her life when she was young, perhaps the carrier of the bad seed. Psychological failures appear to parallel the biological anomalies of the psychopath as he matures regardless of the quality of his parenting. These are failures of internalization, which Heinz Hartmann described as the evolutionary and phylogenetic transfer of functional regulatory mechanisms from outside to inside. Jean Piaget called this process assimilation. Failures of internalization begin with an organismic distrust of the environment and early incorporative deficiencies. As uh, Robert and Phyllis Tyson have pointed out, incorporation is the most developmentally primitive or earliest form of internalization and is most apparent in the normal infant's desire to take everything in through its mouth, whether mother's nipple or a piece of lint on the floor once his, pincer once his pincer grasp has developed. The instinct is to suck and swallow, and then within the first year, to tear, bite, chew, and swallow. If normal development proceeds, these incorporative experiences are mostly pleasurable, gratifying, predictable, and physiologically stabilizing. The infant develops, as Eric Erickson has noted, a basic trust of the environment. In psychopathy, however, these incorporative failures predict subsequent problems with two kinds of internalizations, identifications and interjects. Identifications are ways in which the self or behavior are modified to increase resemblance to the object. Interjections are internalized objects that maintain a relationship to the self and are structurally a part of the superego. Interjections are most apparent in clinical setting, settings when a patient reports that he sees or hears things in his mind that are not considered a part of himself. They're subjectively experienced as not I. In the psychopath, identifications and interjects are either absent, unavailable when wanted, or harsh and unpleasant. There is a paucity of soothing internalization experiences and the child may come to uh, anticipate hard, aggressive objects from the outside with which he then identifies for both adaptation and defense. These objects may be the product of real assaults from the caretakers, or they may be re-internalized projections of his own intense, aggressive impulses, despite the best nurturing efforts of the parents. Anna Freud first noted this phenomenon and called it identification with the aggressor. With the aggressor. Uh, she later refined this and made the distinction between identification with aggression or identification with the aggressor. It is most apparent in the degree to which abused children will closely bond to their abusive parent and their own risk of aggressing in adulthood toward their offspring. Malloy referred to this identification in psychopathy as a predator part object. The primary internalization and core narcissistic identification of the psychopath's grandiose self-structure, which may or may not be a partial product of parental abuse. How is this clinically apparent? Uh, psychopathic adults will often transform benign percepts during Rorschach testing into predatory ones. And here's some examples from um, uh, my work, quote, it's a butterfly with claws, quote, it's a whale with a shark fin. And this was from a uh, woman who actually uh, paired up with a man in Los Angeles and was killing prostitutes with him. And she was actually a nurse. Um, she took some time off to do this for, uh, for a number of months. But this was her first response to the Rorschach. We saw her in prison for research um, uh, about, about five years after she was uh, sentenced to life in prison. Quote, I see two carnivorous wolves. I wish I could see instead two doves mating. Here's another one. A bat or evil moth, a furry animal that doesn't suckle to its mom. <laughs> 
Now, such identifications as these in the real world are manifest in the psychopath's propensity, propensity to engage in planful, deliberate, and emotionless violence. And we call this predatory violence. And the strong association between sadism and psychopathy. The central motivation of the psychopath is to dominate his objects. This, I'm going to say that again because it's so important. The central motivation of the psychopath is to dominate his objects. There is no desire for affectional relating, nor using uh, Trivers' phrase, there's no reciprocal altruism. The psychopath operates from within a dominant submission paradigm and identifies in a conflict-free manner with the predator. This prey-predator dynamic is most apparent in one kind of countertransference response to psychopathic adults. In a large survey study that my wife and I did of mental health and criminal justice professionals, and we had an N here of 584 uh, individuals, uh, we found, and this is published in 2002 and is available on our website, um, we found that 77.3% who had interviewed an adult psychopath reported a physiological reaction that was likely due to sympathetic, activa sympathetic activation of their autonomic nervous system. And they, it was typically a dermatological response. They'd say things like, my skin was crawling, he got my hackles up, he made the hair stand up on my neck, unquote. Other reactions that people reported to us were, uh, quote, felt outside myself numb. There were gastrointestinal issues, quote, my stomach uh, felt like I swallowed cement, unquote. Muscular responses, quote, I was frozen with fear. Uh, pulmonary responses, quote, I couldn't catch my breath. And cardiovascular responses, my heart was pounding. Notice these are all primitive atavistic responses that signal danger. The anticipation of being prey to an intraspecies predator. Okay, uh, the, third, the, the next area I want to discuss, uh, the grandiose self and omnipotent fantasy. Central to psychopathy is a variation of the grandiose self-structure. And this, again, is a theoretical construct delineated by Otto Kernberg in his theoretical understanding of the narcissistic personality disorder. Uh, however, the term grandiose self was, originally, uh, was originated by Heinz Kohut in a paper in 1968. And Heinz Kohut had previously employed the term narcissistic self in a paper two years earlier in 1966. The grandiose self-structure is a pathological formation from a Kernberg perspective, not a normal developmental fixation as argued by the self and relational psychologists. Now, Kernberg theorized that the grandiose self-structure has three condensed components. A real self, this would be the actual specialness of the child, the ideal self, a fantasized image which compensates for oral rage and envy, and an ideal object, a fantasized image of a completely loving and accepting parent, often at odds with the actual behavior of the devalued real parent. Narcissistic psychopathology is fundamental to understanding psychopathy, and the grandiose self is the cognitive and affective core of the character disorder. I'd also like to point out that when the real self and the ideal self are condensed, then there's no tension between the two as we see in normality and therefore no growth. The development of the grandiose self structure, a construct which theoretically remains unconscious while filled with stable conscious images, representations of the self and others, is the framing and drywall that continues the construction of the house of psychopaths. The dominant idealization of the self is that of a predator which diminishes rage and envy toward others. The dominant idealization of the object is the one who will perfectly serve the interests of the psychopath often as his prey. Occasionally we will see the psychopath identify himself with certain omnipotent religious figures to advance his desires. Uh, these religious figures then also become idealized objects within his grandiose self-structure, but are consciously used by him to rationalize extreme aggression, typically 
to rationalize to himself, I think, as well as to others. And this, again, is another case that I was involved in uh, several years ago. A charismatic psychopath identified himself to his family as, quote, walking in Christ, unquote, unquote or Christ, or the Lord. Uh, he also co coerced and persuaded them to believe that God would communicate his pleasures and displeasures only through him to his family me members. Over the course of 30 years, he kept his family isolated and mobile, and he'd physically assault and batter the women in the family over the years uh, when they displeased the Lord. Uh, he eventually murdered nine of his offspring when he was faced with losing some of his children to the police in Child Protective sh Services. Um, this is pretty graphic, but, um, but I want to use it to illustrate something else. Um, what he did when he committed this mass murder is he shot each of the uh, victims in the eye, uh, one shot in the eye. And, and the prosecutors on this case were sort of um, uh, kind of mystified by this. Why would he do this? And, I, and after studying the case, I told them um, uh, that it was my thinking that he did this because uh, uh, he wanted his victims, wanted his face to be the last face that his victims would see. And this was, in a sense, a way to instill uh, the fact and link his image to omnipotence you know, as, they, uh, as they died. Uh, the behavioral devaluation of others, amply illustrated by this case vignette, is the means by which the psychopath maintains a stable, grandiose self-structure. Unlike the narcissistic personality disorder who can devalue in fantasy for years with little revelation of his process to anyone, perhaps other than his psychoanalyst, the psychopath cannot do this solely in fantasy, but instead must aggressively derogate and dismiss others, dismiss others in order to shore up his grandiosity. And such devaluation may run the gamut from cruel teasing to torture and murder. The next area, primitive internalized object relations. As I wrote a number of years ago, quote, when one gazes upon the psychopath, there is less there than meets the eye. Regardless of his IQ, and intelligence is normally distributed uh, in psychopaths. IQ and psychopathy are independent, and that's been replicated about a dozen times. Uh, his personality is organized at a pre adipal or borderline level. This has been empirically demonstrated in extensive research utilizing the Rorschach and various other measures of object relations in more than 400 antisocial and psychopathic children adolescents and adults, both male and female. And this is work that Carl Ciccono and I um, did uh, in the um, 80s and through the 90s. The neurotically organized psychopath appears to be an oxymoron. There is no mature, cohesive, organized, tripartite structure that is id, ego, or superego to the psychopath's personality. It is instead distorted, primitive, fragmented, inadequate, or absent. Internalized objects remain part objects in the sense that good and bad aspects are not integrated into a whole object or representation. Conception of self and others is either good or bad, but is tenuously maintained through the use of primitive defenses so that self-representations are always enhanced and object representations are always devalued. A dyadic part self and part object world exists without or because of the absence of more mature defenses such as repression or sublimation. Uh, here's uh, another case from about uh, seven or eight years ago that I, uh, where I conducted the evaluation. One 34-year-old serial murderer, although both moderately psychopathic and pathologically narcissistic, could not completely rid himself of his bad objects. He was clinically depressed and had very low self-esteem. He hated his mother owing to her abandonment of him and her drunken promiscuities with many men. He selected intoxicated victims his mother's approximate age when she left him and reported rape fantasies toward his mother when he was 13 or 14 years old. He believed he should be executed and he was subsequently sentenced to death. Uh, and he wished his father had killed him when he beat him as a boy. Superego abnormalities. Without attachment or anxiety, 
identifications or interjects that carry with them certain guides to behavior are weakly cathected or non-existent, with such failures of internalization that often begin with imitation of the parents' behaviors, but then expand to include family, school, and community norms and rules, there's a failure to, internalized va to internalize values. The psychopathic adult is a valueless person. The only vestiges of conscience in the psychopathic character are best described by Edith Jacobson as sadistic superego precursors, which she defined as projected aspects of early persecutory objects attributed to others to deny aggression in the midst of frustration. Uh, such precursors in the child psychopath are most evident in his callous, unemotional traits, which have been measured by Paul Frick and his colleagues. These have also been empirically associated with impaired conscience. Also measured, psychopathic children are less distressed by the negative effects of their behaviors on others. They show impaired moral reasoning and empathic concern. And they have difficulty recognizing expressions of sadness in faces and sad vocalizations of other children, as well as facial expressions of fear and at times disgust. Sadism, the experience of pleasure through the dominance and suffering of another, is most, is most clinically evident in childhood cruelty toward animals, particularly pets, domestic pets. The infliction of suffering is the child's attempt to defend against his own helplessness through the exercise of omnipotent control over another object. Uh, Alan Feldhaus, in 1986 paper, demonstrated a significant correlation between the abuse of animals in childhood and protein violence in adulthood. The psychopath lives in a pre-socialized emotional world. He has a range and depth of feeling that is even more constricted than that of a young toddler prior to sustained interaction with peers. So here we're, we're thinking prior to the age of uh, two, two and a half. Consciously felt emotions include excitement, frustration, rage, boredom, envy, dysphoria, and, sh and shame. Uh, such feelings as these do not require whole object relatedness, wherein both self and others are conceived as whole, separate, and meaningful individuals. More mature feelings that require whole object relatedness and a capacity for secure attachment are missing. Such feelings would include anger, fear, guilt, depression, sympathy, jealousy, gratitude, empathy, remorse, sadness, loneliness, and reciprocal joy. These are all emotions that are broad, deep, and complex. Instead, the emotional life of the psychopath typically centers on his internal management of envy something that Kernberg has emphasized in his treatment of narcissistic personalities, and shame, something that Kohut has emphasized in his treatment of narcissistic personalities. These are two affects that often precede intentional destruction of the object in real life. The damaged object diminishes envy since there are no longer any qualities worth possessing. The damaged object diminishes shame since it can no longer threaten as a source of humiliation. And lastly, aggression. Psychopathic individuals do not struggle with tensions of ego dystonic aggression since the impulse to aggress is either immediately acted out or remains a source of aggressive fueling of the grandiose self-structure without conflict or ambivalence. Our Rorschach research has counterintuitively found that antisocial and psychopathic individuals at all ages do not see percepts engaging in, in aggression as often as normals. Um, this was uh, a very, very surprising finding for us. We initially thought that the uh, adult uh, psychopathic subjects we were testing were just censoring their aggressive responses. So they'd look at card one in the Rorschach and see, uh, two men um, mutilating a woman in the middle, and then they'd censor that and they'd say it's a bat. Uh, but we found 
that as we tested adolescents and children, latency age kids, solitary aggressive conduct disorder, latency age kids, age 6 to 11, that they also didn't produce any present aggression in the Rorschach, whereas normal kids do. And what we did was we then went and looked back at uh, early work by uh, David Rappaport and, uh, and his colleagues uh, at, uh, at Austin Riggs and at, at Menninger, uh, at Menninger's and uh, saw that the, what they were talking about when there was present aggression on the Rorschach was they talked about it as uh, tensions of aggressive impulses that were ego dystonic. And that's where we found the key to this finding, that if there's no tension, there's no need to symbolize aggression on the Rorschach. Uh, if it's not ego dystonic, uh, there's no need to project it into a response to the Rorschach. So instead of having to see uh, aggressive acts taking place in the Rorschach, uh, the psychopathic individual can just act it out very syntonically, and it doesn't create uh, any discomfort for himself. And uh, that's our, uh, our explanation for that particular empirical finding. However, uh, psychopathic individuals at all ages did produce more aggressive objects with which they could identify. So for instance, they th see things like guns and bombs and things of that nature. And uh, other people have taken that work forward um, uh, uh, at mostly, mostly this work has been at Mass General Hospital. And they have found that the number of Rorschach aggressive content that is not aggressive acts on the Rorschach, but content itself, has a significant and positive linear correlation with the number of DSM-4 criteria an adult subject meets for antisocial personality disorder, a very simple linear correlation. We also know diagnostically, too, that the more antisocial personality disorder criteria a person meets, uh, the higher their score will be on the psychopathy checklist revised that they do correlate. Empirical research has established that psychopaths engage in two modes of violence more frequently than other non-psychopathic criminals. The first is affective violence, which is characterized by an emotional reaction to an imminent threat. This is very common among psychopaths, especially in the face of immediate frustration or humiliation. Uh, this is also the common garden variety violence we see throughout our species. Um, uh, typically, it's directed, uh, when it occurs, it occurs between people that know each other or are bonded to each other, and it's called affective violence. Other people refer to this as uh, uh, reactive violence or uh, impulsive violence in the literature. The other mode is predatory violence. This is characterized by a lack of emotion, careful planning and preparation, and the lack of autonomic arousal. This is also quite frequent among psychopaths, and it's emblematic of the homicides and sexual homicides which a few of them commit. Now, um, we've had an extraordinary and horrible example of that uh, just uh, within the past two weeks at, uh, in the United States at Virginia Tech, and we have done a number of papers on um, We've done four papers on mass murder that have been published in di four different scientific journals. Uh, several of those are on the website. Um, and we studied adolescent and adult mass murders. And one of the things we found was that uh, in contrast to what the public believes, or has believed, I think, up to this point, was mass murder a very, very rare event, fortunately. Mass murder is caused by people that snap and then impulsively do this. Not true. It's never been true. Uh, we, our studies include uh, 30 adult mass murders and 34 adolescent mass murders, and we found not one case that was affective violence. They're all predatory. How do we know that? Because when we investigated these murders for our research, uh, we found two things. One, lots of evidence of planning and preparation over time. Um, uh, particularly in the last stages as the person approached carrying out the act, which is antithetical to affective violence. We also found the absence of any kind of imminent threat, and also the absence of any kind of um, uh, high degrees of, um, of impulsivity in the acts themselves. 
uh, that was one source of empirical data to, that, that flew in the face of this notion of snapping. Uh, the other data, which was even more horrible and also from a forensic investigative perspective very important, was the surviving witnesses describing the affect of the perpetrator as he was doing this. And we found, as we talked to people over the years that had witnessed and survived a mass murder, invariably they described an individual who was cool, calm, deliberate, and showed no emotion. The psychopathic character appears particularly suited to predation due to his low levels of autonomic arousal, minimal anxiety, emotional detachment, heightened orienting response, empathy defects, sensation-seeking, and fearlessness. So from an evolutionarily adaptive perspective, he's the consummate intraspecies predator. And there's actually a very, very interesting uh, debate in, the, um, in, in this world of um, perversity that uh, uh, is psychopathy uh, uh, a evolutionarily adaptive personality uh, or is it a psychopathology? Is it an abnormal personality? And uh, that debate is uh, the sort of evolutionary adaptive uh, perspective has been adopted by people who many of you may know, and that is uh, Vern Quincy and, and Grant Harris, and then other people, of course, take the position that it's uh, clearly a gross character uh, abnormality. Uh, but there, you can make an argument for there being certain evolutionarily adaptive aspects to psychopathy, but that'll be fruit for discussion. Uh, conclusions. A clinically based psychoanalytic theory of the psychopathic mind is beginning to be delineated through an understanding of his chronic emotional detachment, cortical under arousal, minimal anxiety, failures of internalization, grandiose self-structure, primitive object relations, sadistic superego precursors, narcissistically defined and limited affects, and modes of aggression. He remains a frightening member of our species, present in all walks of life. Understanding the motivation and meaning of his behavior helps our community and society to manage the risks he poses toward others and heightens the sensitivity of psychoanalytic clinicians when such psychopathology becomes apparent in the consulting room. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. I've entitled this paper Degrees of Psychopathy versus the Psychopath in order to draw attention to the problem of reification. In this regard, I think there's a notable difference between Dr. Malloy's essay on antisocial personality disorder and the paper that he delivered today. Although in both he refers to degrees of psychopathy ranging from mild 10 to 19 to moderate 20 to 29 to severe 30 or above on the hair psychopathy checklist. Uh, so although he referred to degrees of psychopathy in that way, today he claimed that, quotes, the more severe the psychopathy, the more psychobiologically rooted is the cause, unquote, and he proceeded on this basis, I think, in my reading, um, to separate out the primary psychopath from those who, by comparison, seem barely to merit the diagnosis of psychopathy at all. Though he referred today to Lickens' 1957 differentiation between secondary or anxious and primary or non-anxious psychopaths, in an adjacent sentence, Dr. Malloy stated categorically that, quotes, anxiety is minimal or absent in psychopathy, a statement that implies that the anxious secondary psychopath is not really a psychopath at all. Similarly, he states categorically that, quotes, his, the psychopath's personality is organized at a pre oedipal or borderline level, which is no doubt true of the primary psychopath, who again, now seems to be the only psychopath worthy of the name. Now I think here we are encountering in the field of psychopathy a problem afflicting the whole field of psychodiagnosis. The tendency for the conception of degrees or continua of pathology 
to collapse into polarized or reified syndromes. But this is merely a particular instance of the wider problem of human consciousness as such. As what George Steiner calls language animals, we try to understand the baffling complexity and flux of our experience by making distinctions, carving out and naming categories. But our distinctions and categories tend to turn into reified or falsely concretized concepts with all the consequences in racism, sexism, etc., that we know all too well. Instead of speaking of the mild, moderate, and severe degrees of narcissism and psychopathy displayed by neurotics, borderlines, and psychotics, we are instead inclined to speak of narcissists and psychopaths. Because the so-called primary psychopath is alleged to have no remorse and to be incurable, we may come to feel justified in remorselessly killing him, especially now that due to DNA evidence of his guilt, we have less cause to worry about the possibility of executing an innocent person. In this sense, the diagnosis of primary psychopathy might serve to rationalize enactment of our own homicidal inclinations. It may serve, us to, it may serve to help us kill the killers, and in so doing, become them. On the other hand, the biological theory of primary psychopathy or severe psychopathy might have the opposite effect not of scapegoating the psychopath, but of exonerating him. After all, if his condition is biologically determined, what sense does it make to hold him responsible and to punish him for a condition entirely outside his own control? To the argument that psychoanalytic understanding is equally deterministic and that free will and responsibility are no more negated by a biological than by a psychoanalytic view, of the determinants of personality and behavior, I would reply that Freud's psychic determinism, the view that the ego is not even master in its own psychic house, was always contradicted by Freud's contrary and equally important revelation of the remarkable degree to which we are, in fact, the unconscious agents of our fate. In this connection, my clinical experience over the years has convinced me that no one really gets away with anything. However repressed or split off, the unconscious superego, like the biblical God who called on to Adam, where art thou, and who said unto Cain, where is Abel, thy brother? The unconscious superego knows and sees all, and unless guilt is faced and born, unconsciously arranges for its punishment. If you think psychopaths, unlike ordinary sinners, have no superego and can get away with anything, note how many of them wind up in jail. Let me emphasize that it has not been my aim to cast doubt on the validity of the science reviewed for us by Dr. Malloy, but rather to express in the spirit of Max Weber my anxiety regarding its potential unintended social consequences. Sociologists in the 1960s developed a critique of asylums and the institutionalization they were found to create. No one anticipated that governments would welcome such research as an opportunity to cut spending with the consequences of homeless ambulatory schizophrenics living in cardboard boxes in Parkdale. What worries me is what might well be the unintended consequences of the new biological research on psychopathy. Namely, one, the, utilization, the utilization of such evidence to form a reified or falsely concretized conception of the psychopath that invites projection and scapegoating. Two, the denial of a psychopathic dimension of human personality as such that takes the form of a continuum from mild to moderate to extreme, an idea that forces us to confront the degree of psychopathy in ourselves instead of projecting it into the other and condemning and possibly persecuting or even executing it there. Naturally, I am in no way implying that potential misuse of scientific truth in any way justifies irrationalist evasion or denial of such truth. As Dr. Malloy quite correctly emphasizes, the frightening reality of severe psychopathy must be faced. We're, we're all inclined to deny it. including 
as what must be faced, the scientific evidence of significant biological factors in its causation. I trust it's clear that I am in no way positing nurture against the new evidence of the role of nature in the genesis of severe psychopathy. I'm only arguing against the tendency to reify the psychopath as such, and I'm not accusing Dr. Malloy of doing that all over the map. I, I think he does it a bit at times. Uh, uh, at other times, he clearly uh, writes within a continuum concept. So I'm referring here to what I see as a tension in his work, not, uh, not, not a kind of a consistent problem. For just as the frightening reality of severe psychopathy must be faced, so must the frightening potential uses of this reality. In my view, one way to work against such misuse is to adhere scrupulously to the continuum concept, which in reminding us of the lesser degrees of psychopathy we share with those who manifest it in more severe forms, makes it more difficult for us to project and scapegoat others for what we refuse to see in ourselves. I'm curious to learn whether or not Dr. Malloy shares my anxieties. If not, why not? And if so, what he thinks might be done to prevent such misuse. I think there is something to um, this uh, issue of uh, reification categorization versus dimensionality. We know that uh, from an empirical perspective that personality is better understood dimensionally than categorically and that, uh, and that comes from the, uh, from the personality researchers that are uh, in a sense 10 to 15 years ahead of what's out in DSM and ICD where still we're using categories, and that uh, we, in a sense, carve nature closely to the bone with dimensions rather than with categories, although we use categories to simplify and reify and communicate more directly and more efficiently. And I think I do go back and forth. It's never been as clear to me as uh, until now when you've talked about it. And I think I probably reify when I'm mad at them. And uh, which actually makes great sense to me, so I don't have any anxiety about it. But um, uh, the but it is there's really a back and forth, and you actually see that in the psychopathy researcher research in a broader sense that you have uh, a pe there's a big argument on whether psychopathy is a taxon or not, and that's really hotly debated in the research, and there's people that are studying that, and there's uh, also. Uh, something that I've come more and more to, and that is when I talk about psychopathy from a research perspective, I talk about the psychopath, and that's how, in a sense, he's been empirically, in a sense, categorized and put into a box for research purposes. And then when I talk about it from a treatment and diagnostic perspective, and when I do the forensic work, I talk about it dimensionally, and I'll use the mild, moderate to severe, because that's, you know, it just, it's, I think it's much cl uh, closer to nature. Um, I think that uh, I, I think that you see the narcissistic rage uh, in some individuals that have various levels of psychopathic disturbance. But I think it's also I I, I find that psychoanalysts are very resistant to considering um, aggression that is done uh, predatorily, that is done in a very uh, detached, uh, unemotional way, uh, where they're. Um, uh, there isn't any affect that's being defended against. You know, there's no rage that's being defended against. It's a very primitive, it's an evolved uh, hunting behavior that through the uh, disinhibitions of the psychopath, he's able to express, I think we all have it. I think we all have a capacity to be predatory. Uh, 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 and uh, we, uh, if our ancestors hadn't been good predators, we wouldn't be here. Uh, that they were good hunters and they were the best hunters. Uh, yet, uh, now, predation typically is unnatural in our species and typically is quite hurtful. And with the psychopath, there's less uh, inhibitions against that, inhibitions that we all have, except when we're in parking lots of grocery stores. <laughs> and then we tend to be much more predatory. And the bursts of narcissistic rage come out at those moments, too, when that person takes that parking place that we wanted, or, of course, we had, because we're special. But, um, but so I think, you know, and again, I hear you say, well, you know, deep down inside, you know, there's guilt or there's, you know, there's, uh, there's conflict. Well, you know, I've, I've heard that so many times. Typically, I hear it from analysts. Um, they don't want to give up the notion that uh, these individuals typically, and Don made reference to this too, that typically um, when, 
you know, if they're caught and if they stumble and if they end up in jail, obviously it's because they were conflicted and there was a desire to be called and they may have been driven it's, at some level by, by guilt of what, basically what Freud talked about as the, you know, as the, the, the pale criminal, the criminal driven by a, you know, by a sense of guilt, which I think sadly makes up very few of the individuals that are in custody. I think typically psychopathically disturbed individuals are caught because of their sense of impunity. Impunity is their Achilles heel, and it's an aspect of their narcissism. And in many cases of these individuals, that's what I've seen, as they become a bolder and more creative uh, in their criminality and their violence, uh, they take more chances. Uh, the narcissism, uh, there's sort of a feeding mechanism where they uh, develop this sense of being uh, larger than life and unable to be caught and very special. And that typically then becomes their, uh, becomes their downfall. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at tvo.org.